Good evening and welcome. My name is Catherine Marsden and I'm the co-chair of the Student Advisory Council for the Institute of Politics. Our role is to help encourage students to be excited about and engaged with politics, community involvement, and social service. Part of that involves organizing events, like this one, on diverse and thought-provoking topics. Tonight we'll be discussing um, a valuable campaign tool, polling and polling analysis. The 2012 presidential campaigns used a sophisticated mix of quantitative and qualitative data to understand voter concerns, test ideas, and to help craft the most compelling messages for their candidates. Tonight, we'll go behind the curtain for an in-depth look at this process with the top three researchers for both the Obama and Romney campaigns. Our panelists tonight, in alphabetical order, are Joel Benenson, the president and chief executive of Benenson Strategy Group, which he founded in 2000. He's been the chief pollster and a senior strategist for President Obama since 2008. Uh, Joel also worked on President Bill Clinton's 1996 re-election campaign. He advised Fortune 100 companies, leading advocacy and charitable, group, charitable groups, and politicians around the country. Neil Newhouse is joining us live via teleconference, um, and we'd like to give a special thanks to the IT department for that. Um, he's a partner and co-founder of Public Opinion Strategies and was lead pollster for Governor Romney's 2012 presidential campaign. He's also worked, also worked on President Bush's 2004 re-election campaign, was a pollster, pollster for the successful U.S. Senate campaigns of Scott Brown of Massachusetts and Rand Paul of Kentucky, as well as about a dozen members of Congress. Neil also served as the Republican partner in the NBC News Wall Street Journal poll in 2008. Tonight's moderator, John Harwood, is the chief Washington correspondent for CNBC and a political writer for the New York Times. His illustrious career began in high school when he worked as a copy boy for the Washington Star. Um, after studying history and economics at Duke University, where he graduated magna cum laude, um, he joined the St. Petersburg Times, and then after that was named a Neiman Fellow at, the Har at Harvard University. He then joined the Wall Street Journal as the White House correspondent during George H.W. Bush's administration. He joined CNBC in 2006 and in 2007 joined the New York Times. Some of the things we'll be discussing tonight include the key re research insights and techniques that drove each campaign, how campaigns used this data to see the electorate before the race, what roles research played in identifying and understanding base and swing voters, how research helped guide effective messaging, and how events of the campaign, primaries, debates, media coverage, altered voter perceptions, and campaign strategies. In the 500th convocation address by the university president, Robert Zimmer, he explained what defines the University of Chicago by stating that it's a place of constant questioning and challenge, of evaluating our own assumptions, of energy in pursuit of clarity, of ideas and not deference, of belief in the impact of ideas on the quality of human life. And that's what we're all doing here tonight. So thank you all for coming. We'd like to thank the panelists for giving our institute the privilege of hosting them. They're an extraordinarily talented individuals with a great deal of insight to provide. It's an honor to be able to introduce them, and with that, please join me in welcoming our panel. I just wanted, I wanted to add one point, which is Neil Newhouse has been patiently sitting there on the other end of this uh, video hookup. He made a valiant effort to get out here and join us uh, tonight and was uh, defeated by wind. Uh, but but, but David, David it's, it's an appropriate metaphor that you mentioned airplanes and, and everything else we had to go through today. The, I guess it was fog in Chicago or whatever the heck it was, but I, I, uh, I missed, I, I was unable to catch e any of three different flights coming into Chicago, so it wasn't for lack of effort, but, uh, yeah. but thank you. Well, we appreciate the effort. I just want to let you know why he's there and we're here. Well, I must say when I um, got on the plane today from Washington, it was delayed a few minutes and the the flight attendant said right as we took off, you know, this was the last plane that they let land in Washington and then turn around and go back to Chicago because of weather. So um, uh, I guess the fact that Neil did not make that flight was the reason why he couldn't get there afterwards. Um, well, first of all, let me just uh, thank you for having us here and thank you to David for inviting me. Uh, I, I never um, uh, cease to be amazed and uh, uh, pleased to be invited to speak for groups like this because I remember how my career started um, in 1984, just to, when I was just a few years older than you guys. I was fresh out of school. I was covering the uh, Ronald Reagan re-election campaign, flying all around the country with the Reagan White House people, and there was one point where they said, well, we're going to 
the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel. We're going to have a big fundraiser for Reagan, and this is a black tie event, so dress appropriately for the press who was going. So at that time, I, I owned one black suit, or dark suit. I packed the suit, went, got all dressed up, and I was with all these rich, powerful people and, you know, very impressed by the uh, wattage of all the folks who were there. And I went into the restroom at one point and, um, and got a, reminded again of the distance between me and them because I, I uh, washed my hands and I reached for a uh, uh, towel from the dispenser. And as soon as I grabbed the towel, this uh, older guy in a tux walks in and says, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> so, um, but let me just start by telling you a little bit about myself and how I got into this business and, uh, and how I got to know David. Um, I grew up around politics and journalism. My dad had a long career at the Washington Post, and so I grew up in Washington, watched him cover the Civil Rights Revolution, the Vietnam War, all of the Watergate, all of the things that were happening that were so, um, seemed so vital to the future of the country. And so I grew up with the, the notion that this was a pretty great way to make a living. Um, I uh, went down to Florida for, um, the St. Petersburg Times, which is a very good regional paper in Florida, now called the Tampa Bay Times. Um, was there for a few years covering local government and then state government in Tallahassee, came to Washington, um, and eventually uh, moved over to the Wall Street Journal, as you heard. Um, I was aware of David in, uh, during 1984, during that year I was doing uh, re-election politics because he was a political reporter at that time for the Chicago Tribune, but I really met him in 1987, when he was uh, advising the presidential campaign of this really terrific guy named Paul Simon, who was a U.S. senator from Illinois, uh, his campaign didn't go very far, but, uh, but I've known David ever since that time. And I was very struck in 2004 by uh, a conversation I had with David in the winter, right as the Democratic primaries were heating up or, you know, had heated up. And I was a big admirer of the political talents and potential of John Edwards, and David was advising John Edwards. And um, we were on the phone one time, and he said, just by the way, you should know that I've got a guy here in Illinois who's better than Edwards. I said, really? Who is that? And he said, well, he's a, he's a state senator, and he's running for the nomination for the Senate. Said, okay, ho-hum, what, what about him? Well, he's, he's African American. Hmm, that's interesting. What's his name? His name's Barack Obama. And I said, get out of town. You cannot elect a guy named Barack Obama to a statewide <laughs> office in a big state like Illinois. And uh, he said, well, I just want you to meet him uh, the next time he's in Washington. And so this was before the convention speech where he made the big uh, splash, Red America, uh, Blue America, We're One America. Um, this was like in March. He came to Washington. I think he was raising money and seeing Democratic leaders. And I um, uh, sat down with him, and we talked for an hour. And I was so blown away by the, uh, the intelligence and the instincts and, and just everything that he represented. He brought me a copy of his um, book, uh, uh, Dreams from My Father, which uh, he wrote a nice inscription on, and then I about a year later, lost. Um, very bad move on my part. Um, but I was very proud of the column that I wrote out of this. I wrote a column, you know, very, these guys like have all the information and they can see into the future a lot better than journalists can. But I had decided that this guy was hot stuff and so I wrote a column in the Wall Street Journal, the lead of which was something like, you've never heard of Barack Obama but he's gonna be a big deal. And I recounted the interview. Unfortunately, the conventions of journalism uh, require, or at least we decided that they require, that I find a Republican rising star to be matched with Obama in this story. And I picked a guy who ran for governor of the state of Washington, lost, and has lost every election since then. <laughs> His name is Dino Rossi. You had never heard of him then, and you will never hear of him. Um, so, I want to kick it off by f asking first Neil, uh, who was my classmate, by the way, at uh, Duke University, to talk a little bit uh, simply about 
how you got into the business of politics and how you became a uh, pollster for the Republican nominee. All right. Um, hey, John, one, one quick note. Um, I used to do polling for the Republicans in Illinois State Senate and I had a great relationship. This goes back to like the 1980s cycle, truthfully, and uh, had a good, good relationship. And when Obama was running for U.S. Senate, I got a call from those guys saying, hey, this guy's for real. You better watch out. You better, you better you know, be careful what you wish for here. So anyway, it's it, 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 great minds think alike. They were, they were thinking the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, John, oh, I grew up in Kansas. I'm, I'm from Kansas originally, Kansas City area. I was never really interested in politics until I went to college. And I took a course in voting behavior, and it just, it really kind of turned me on. And this was not, this is, I'm a, I'm a your B beer classmate. I'm a little, I think, older than you. But I went through the 1972 election cycle and followed that election extraordinarily closely. And we had two well-known pollsters come down to Duke University to talk to us about, um, about the, the election. They were Peter Hart and Pat Cadell. Um, who are now, to Joel and I, and, and John, you, household names, but I mean, you've got to be kidding me. I've, I've now worked with these guys. But um, it kind of whetted my appetite about, 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 the, uh, about polling, about data. And as a frustrated old kind of high school competitive athlete, I love the competition of politics. So I went to graduate school, University of Virginia, then kind of migrated to Washington. And in, in Washington, I uh, worked for the Republican National Committee in survey research. They had a survey research department. I was an intern there, very first time I came, came to Washington. My intern coordinator is a guy by the name of Carl Rove. <laughs> this is, you know, years ago. Um, and I became interested in fascinating in campaigns, ended up going through what they call the Campaign Management College at, at the Republican National Committee, ran a congressional campaign in 1976, and got a freshman Republican elected over a six-term Democratic incumbent, where I, where I debated the incumbent congressman three times, my candidate debated him twice. <laughs> I was like, it's, you know, and I was just, I became fascinated with this stuff. And so I went back and, and ran campaigns, uh, worked with the Republican National Committee through the 1980 cycle, and then joined up with, uh, with Ronald Reagan's pollster, Dick Worthlin, uh, in the 1984 election cycle and have been doing kind of polling ever since. Um, we started our own firm about 20, 20, 22 years ago or so, Bill McIntyre, Glenn Bolger and I. And um, we worked We worked after that in Bob Dole campaign. Uh, we worked, uh, I worked for George W. Bush and did ad testing for him. But I uh, was, I got pulled into doing a lot of work in Massachusetts. I did Bill Weld's work in Massachusetts, uh, who was incumbent governor, did Paul Salucci, did Jane Swift. And then when uh, Mitt Romney was, was, uh, was running, I got pulled into that because I, I became kind of the in-house Republican pollster in Massachusetts. I knew the state pretty well. And we had a good, a good track record of electing Republicans. So Mike Murphy was a media consultant. I got pulled into, into doing that. And when the time came for his presidential run in 08, um, I had to step aside because my partner, uh, Bill McIntyre, was doing, doing John McCain's work. So I, you know, I had to step aside from the Romney campaign, let Bill do the, uh, because Bill had a longstanding relationship with John McCain, went through that campaign, and then after uh, the 08 election, signed back up with, with Mitt Romney for the uh, 2012 election. Um, what Joel didn't tell me when I asked him about what it was like to work on a presidential campaign was how, odd, how, how consuming it was. And I happened to ask him one time, well, how much time do you spend in Chicago? And he gave me such a runaround. I'm thinking, oh, my God, he must be spending all his time out there. And so uh, when it came time to do the, uh, the Romney campaign, um, I decided I was actually going to you know, kind of let one of my partners handle my clients, and I moved up there full time about a year and a half before the election to do nothing but the Romney campaign for the last year and a half. The it was the single best professional experience I've, I've had in my life. It was an incredible experience. I thoroughly enjoyed it, except for that last except for that little bit at the end. <laughs> Neil, before I, I get Joel started, let me just ask you one uh, quick postscript. Um, in light of your decision to move to Boston and let your partners handle your other clients. 
Could you not have created a separation like that in 08 and done Romney while Bill was doing McCain, or is that simply not practically possible? Um, the Romney campaign wouldn't have gone for that. They, I mean, we, we could have, we have a separate entity that's, you know, Chinese walled off, et cetera, but Romney campaign wouldn't have gone for that. And so, I mean, we, we didn't, we, we, we discussed it initially, but it didn't, it didn't go very far. And so that, and, and truthfully, John, 2008, um, my kids were still, my daughter was still at home. This, you know, I was, the kids were in college. It, it, I mean, I had the freedom to come up to, uh, to Boston, and I spent something like 10 days in Washington over the last year, year of the campaign. I mean, when you talk about living in Boston, I, you know, it's lock, stock, and barrel. Well, and, and truth be told, his son, who went to Tulane, where my middle daughter is now in school, was also working uh, uh, in the same building uh, for the Republican campaign, and so he got to hang with his kid. Yeah, that, yeah, and that and the bars across the street was a, was a big benefit. Yeah. <laughs> Joel? Uh, I have a fairly nonlinear path, um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I, I do, look, Neil and Bill McInturf are uh, two of the best pollsters in the business, and. Uh, you know, an occasion comes up where people want to have a Democrat and Republican, sometimes on a public affairs issue or some other business. Uh, Bill and Neil are the two guys I recommend first, and we've had the good fortune to work together uh, on a couple of things over the years. So we're colleagues, not just adversaries. And it is, it is a great thing. It is like sports, and, and we share a passion for sports. You get over things, you, one guy wins, the other guy loses, you shake hands, you go on, you're still friends, you're still doing the same thing, playing for different teams. Um, I got to polling pretty late in life, actually. I didn't get into this business until right before that Clinton campaign in 1996. I had been, uh, I'd been in uh, a theater major in college. I dabbled in avant-garde theater in the 70s and uh, somehow became a reporter in the early 1980s, and I, I loved journalism. I thought I wanted to cover the New York Yankees when I started, uh, and somehow I just, uh, all the uh, political uh, embers got rekindled, if you will. And, uh, and I started covering politics for the New York Daily News and did that for about 12 years, including covering Governor Mario Cuomo. And then in the early 90s, um, he was you know, doing his tap dance with running for president or not, and I kept calling this guy out in Chicago, David Axelrod, who was always giving me great quotes, you know, <laughs> and uh, would always have nice things to say about Governor Cuomo in the process. And, uh, you couldn't get a lot of Democrats who would talk about Governor Cuomo because they all wanted to end up working for him if he ever ran for, for uh, president. But um, it's kind of in the, I, I went to work, they, I started to think about becoming a political consultant. You know, it was the early 90s, newspapers were kind of beginning to fade. You could see the handwriting on the wall if you were really paying attention, and it had already been a second career for me. Some of us were too stupid to read the signals. <laughs> well, no, you went to TV. <laughs> that was pretty smart. Uh, and they uh, do bo doing both. <laughs> the, um, uh, but I, uh, I thought I wanted to be a media consultant, and I got, I got asked to, to work on Mario Cuomo's campaign in 94 as his communications director. That's when Axe and I actually got to meet, because he did some of the TV advertising for us, and at the end of that campaign, which we lost, I remember having breakfast with David and, and one of his business partners then saying, you know, I think I, I'm going to go, you know, learn about making ads and try and do this. And he said, you should, you should. <clears throat> so I got a job in an ad agency, uh, which at the time, most of you won't remember this, but some of you will. I can look around. There were AT&T and MCI were in this pitch battle for long distance service. And they were, AT&T was approaching it like a political campaign, and they wanted a political strategist on the team. So I was in there, and about two months in, I saw this guy give a poll presentation on an ad test they had done. It was from a firm called Pinchon in Berlin, and they were doing President Clinton's polling at the time. And I saw this guy do this presentation, I thought, I love that. I want to be the guy in the front of the room with all these numbers, telling people what they mean. And it was that much of a, of a whim. I went home, I said to my wife, this is, I never thought about this. I was always good with numbers, but I will say I never took a statistics class in my life. And uh, so I kind of badgered them for a few months, and they ended up hiring me in 95 to work. Uh, I was working for Mark Penn at the time on the Clinton campaign. And, uh, and then I started this company in 2000. And um, I got very lucky. Uh, I got to work on a couple of things in Illinois here with Axe over the years. I don't think I ever won one with you in Illinois. Uh, and 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then it still am, obviously. <laughs> I, oh, you were talking about, as I said. <coughs> the, uh, but uh, I got pretty lucky in late 2006. There were a couple of folks who were uh, starting to talk to our firm about um, possibly running for president, and some folks I liked. And I remember getting advice from Axelrod because we were a small firm. And he just kept saying, just sit tight for a bit, just sit tight for a bit. And, uh, so clearly, the, the, pretty much the, the, the luckiest professional moment in my life happened uh, when David uh, <laughs> called and said, uh, Senator Obama's going to run. We're going to do this, and I want you to be part of this. And uh, it's been a great ride. And I think, as Neil said, his last year and a half was the best professional experience of his life. I mean, these six years have been extraordinary. So, uh, But for those of you who are young in this room, it doesn't have to be a linear path. Just uh, don't listen to everybody who tells you you got to figure out by the time you graduate what you have to do. Uh, it took me many years after I graduated from college, but if you just uh, keep finding what those things you're passionate about along the way, you'll end up doing the right thing eventually. Uh, two quick questions as a postscript to your bio. First of all, what is the best role of your acting career? And two, who does more good for society, having worked in both fields, journalists or political strategists? Who does more good for society? Um, well, the acting career is, I, I had two roles that, if I was a really good actor, I wouldn't be sitting here now, right? <laughs> so uh, I had two roles that, uh, that I liked a lot. There was an old Jules Pfeiffer play called Little Murders, where I played a wacky father that in the movie was played by Vincent Gardini. I can't remember who played it on stage, but I got to do it in a, in a summer stock company one year, and that was a great kind of absurdist drama, uh, uh, but, um, and then I played a character in The Birthday Party by Harold Pinter, uh, which, um, Pinter is very sparse, and it was a character named Seamus McCann, and I had to learn how to do an Irish brogue, which I can't barely do anymore, and I had to tear a broadsheet newspaper at the opening of the second act in five perfect columns without folding it. So I had to practice, this was, and I had no idea why the character was doing this until late in the, in, the, in the process, the director said, well, you know, tearing paper is a sign of sexual frustration. And I said, well, that's not going to help. I, I still can't tear it in five pages. <laughs> and that was it. And I did manage to learn how to tear it in five pages. And I sang an Irish ditty with my Irish brogue, which I still sing once in a while. But I won't do it tonight. That's outstanding. Well, I don't know who does uh, uh, more for society. I, I, I haven't elected anybody president. Um, the, the, probably until 2011, the thing that I was probably best known for in my entire life was sitting there across from Barack Obama when he killed a fly in an interview that was on his hand. <laughs> and that, Maureen Dowd, my friend who writes for the New York Times, wrote a, a line in her column saying, unfortunately for John Harwood, whatever else he does in his life, the one line in his obituary will be, he was the guy who was there when Obama killed the fly. But then, then I was there moderating a Republican debate when Rick Perry forgot the name of the third agency <laughs> that he was trying to kill. And I wrote Maureen a note and I said, you might have to rewrite my obituary. And uh, I got played on Saturday Night Live, so that was, that was a lot of fun. So can but, I answer the second part of John, John, oh. Yeah. John, it was a follow-up question you asked that, that really put him on the spot, right? Yes, it, yes, it was. Yeah. That's right, with the help from my producer. Um, having done both, going back to the question that, that uh, uh, and, I, and I'd be curious your take, Neil, having been the, not, not been a journalist, but look, I, I think they both, in this democracy, particularly in this day and age, have an incredible role to play. Um, I think most political consultants are misunderstood, and I think most journalists are in the, uh, misunderstood. I think the public uh, sees them at the most superficial level and doesn't fully appreciate how committed people are to what they believe and to the democracy. That's why and, our approval rating is around like 20 yeah, percent well, or something? Right. <laughs> well, look, it's the world has changed, uh, but I say you have a critical role because if, if we don't have, you know, journalism keep pace with the technology and play the role it plays in keeping government and politicians honest, it will have a, a very deleterious effect on the democracy. And for political consultants, I think, Look, and some of us probably have the luxury, you heard Neil talk about, you know, the greatest experience of his life in a race that, you know, we've all been on the losing end. Those things are always tough. But the truth is, if you're working for people you believe in as a consultant, 
Um, and I think if you have the, the good fortune to do that, uh, you're not only going to sleep well at night, but you are going to think that you're, you're really pushing the democracy forward in a way that uh, may sound idealistic still for a couple of grizzled veterans like us, but I suspect it's what moved you to Boston and keeps us on the road doing what we do. You know what, Joe? I, I wouldn't change a thing about my career, about what I've done, and about, you know, and I feel good about, about my business and what I do for a living, but um, I think political consultants play a, a fairly significant role in and contributing towards the kind of polarization that we're that we're looking at right now in DC, and it's you know, and I think that uh, I mean, given given the question John you asked about about you know uh, you know I was the good of democracy you know consultants or journalists um, I probably despite where I am I probably side with journalists in terms of informing people exposing uh, you know. Letting people know what they need to know, and and kind of exposing some of the warts and some of the uh, the problems with the system. I I choose them over over my uh, my brother. That is the definition of statesmanship, right there. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about polling. Um, you know that campaigns and candidates see issues differently, have different values, uh, different philosophies, but I've always assumed that you guys, as the guys who get paid to look at the data, ultimately have the same sense of reality about where the race is. And I, and, and I, wanna, I wanna sort of test that by asking you, um, and, and I assume that at every point in the race, if I could give truth serum to each of you who I talk to constantly during the campaigns, that they would see the race as being in the same place. I think this year might have been a little bit different because of theories about who was going to be in the electorate and who wasn't. But talk a little bit, Neil, about once Romney won the nomination, um, what did you see from your research as the place geographically, demographically, where the race uh, was going to be decided? And how did you see the, um, those voters who were remaining, not very many of them, to be persuaded? How did you see uh, the forces weighing on them? There's a, there's a lot there, and if, I, and if I don't cover everything, John, I'm not sure we'll, we'll have time to talk about it. Um, after we got the nomination, um, we've been through, I mean, we've been through a bruising Republican primary battle, um, lasting about 11 months from the first debate to the to when Rick Santorum dropped out of the race. We had a, an image that was one to one, um, favorable versus unfavorable, I and mean, it was not it was not we weren't in a great position. Um, and we were out of money, which was, or at least I mean, effectively out of out of money for the for the primary. Um, we were running against what we thought was a, a pretty vulnerable incumbent, but we didn't. I mean, I, I know I know this has been a, a point of contention. We didn't see this as really just a referendum on the incumbent. We saw it as a race that we had to win. A race that we had to we had to prove that Mitt had a plan. We had to demonstrate that, that Mitt had the credentials here. Um, we thought that the key vote, I mean, the key states were the, I mean, there, there was not much uh, um, discussion about, about you know, what states were going to be in play. I mean, it was, you know, the top eight states from the, uh, from the get-go. And then we, you know, Wisconsin was, you know, it wasn't played because of Paul Ryan. Pennsylvania, we played in late. But for the most part, it was, it was pretty clear. And of those states, it was Virginia and Florida and Ohio. Uh, that really got a lot of our attention. Uh, in terms of voter groups, I mean, we had to convince voters who voted for Obama in 2008 um, to move toward Mitt Romney. And so our campaign was always, we were, there was a division between the finance guys and people who were giving you money and people who you're trying to sway. People who are giving us money, want us to beat their religion, it's not out of, out of Barack Obama, call him a liar, call him, you know, and, and just, throw the kitchen sink at the guy without realizing the voters we need we need to get are the ones who actually voted for this guy last time. So we can't we can't tell them how stupid they were to do that. We've got to say, hey, you know, you're you, we expected more. And it hasn't, you know, it hasn't come to fruition. We, we had to be a lot more subtle, a lot more nuanced in trying to get go for those voters. And our key target audience really was 
um, white women who voted for Obama in, in 08 who are either undecided or on the bubble now. That's our key target audience. We also obviously, you know, we had to pay attention to rural voters, to evangelicals, um, to uh, Latinos. I mean, it, uh, the list goes on and on, but the key swing voter in this group, for, in, in this election, was white women. And we, we really didn't, we, we were unable, we did well among white women, but not nearly well enough. Joel, do you think that you basically perceived the same race that Neil did? Um, I, I, I don't know for sure, and I'm not, I'm not ducking the question. I mean, the, the truth is, is that uh, on, on our end, uh, I think we would strategize a lot about what campaign we would run if we were running Romney's campaign. Pretty early on, you try to think about it. And I'm sure they came to some of the same conclusions. I think some of the things that you can't control. You know, we had the luxury of not having a primary. So, of course, we're sitting there, you know, in the back seat kind of watching, uh, you know, those guys behind the wheel doing bumper cars. Um, and they're paying a price for it. And I think Neil hit something on the head. You know, one analyst at one point said that um, uh, in the spring of 2012, whichever one of these guys wins is going to break history. Barack Obama will either be reelected with the highest unemployment rate of any president but Mitt Romney will be elected with the highest unfavorable rating of any candidate for president. And both of those statements were actually true at that time. They did come out of their uh, primary, I think, paying a little bit of a price for the primary. Um, so, um, no, I, I actually, there were things that I saw a little bit differently. I kept waiting for a moment when Mitt Romney would find an opportunity to move to the center and really put a stake in the ground where he separated himself from the hard right of the party. And maybe the length of the primaries made that harder to do. Uh, maybe they thought it was too risky during the primaries. That was probably the thing I worried about the most. Um, and, uh, you know, David might have some different views. But I, I think we saw a race where um, we understood and, and spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. Neil makes the point, you know, 53% of the people voted for President Obama in 2008. Uh, he was only the fourth Democrat in history to get 53% of the vote or more. Our job was to make sure that, you know, if we thought our core number, our floor was around 48, you know, we had five points there. We had to get about two and a half points. And while we, we wanted to get as many votes as we could, we kind of knew realistically we were playing to get to 51% of the vote, which I, oddly enough is where we ended up. Um, but... Um, you know, we knew that there was a lot of texture to the way people were viewing this economic crisis. And the truth is, we never saw as much disappointment as, as Neil. So it would come up quite a bit. But there was also a, a reason why they were still keeping the president in their consideration set, if you will. And they had a very layered view and textured view of the economic crisis and its aftermath, whether any president could have fixed it or not. You know, we our job was to see a pathway there, which... I think we're able to build a very credible case off some very tough decisions that the president made that, um, you know, was getting the country moving in the right direction. You know, we never went too far out by overstating the progress we were making. We were very cautious about that. We knew there was this fragile sense that things were getting a little bit better, but not too far. So uh, we probably, you know, had different missions in a way. And that might have led to slightly different views of what you had to accomplish and what you had to do in that election. Let, let me ask you one thing, um, and, and I'm going to start with Neil, on the issue of Mitt moving to the center. Because the one time when it seemed that that happened, or people decided that it had happened, was in that first debate. And, you know, for so much of the year, the story seemed to be nothing moving. The, the numbers were very sticky. The, the, everybody moved within a narrow band. There weren't that many undecided voters. Then you had the, the first debate, and uh, Romney did very well. What I could never figure out was whether the race had actually changed or that that was uh, the kind of cyclical thing that would happen as a matter of course when you had a uh, debate. You told me afterwards, 75% of Romney's rise would have happened anyway. It wasn't really about the debate itself. And Neil, uh, I, I wonder how much you thought that changed the race and whether it made you think, wow, we should have communicated a message like that earlier. Can I, can I just yeah. 
take the first part. Just Neil, I'll, just give me one second. I didn't say 70% right. of his rise. I said what he gained was coming back from people he lost after the 47%. No, no, incident. that's what I mean. The, the, the 75% because, of it was going to happen regardless of the debate. Well, because it's post 47%. I don't know if there are a couple of kids who were at an earlier presentation I did. And I'll just say this and move on. From our data perspective, I, and I showed this slide earlier this afternoon to some of the students. On September 4th, before the conventions, our lead in our battleground states was 50 to 46. Our lead almost never varied from 50 to 46, a four-point lead, through the end of the election. We grew to a seven-point lead after the 47% comment, which was soft Romney voters moving away from him. Our total still only went to 51. And you always thought those were go and that we always was going down again. And we always thought they would go again. back. And the data I showed today took us out through October 11th, we were still ahead 50 to 46 in our battleground state. It was completely inelastic uh, in our polling from September 4th, after the Republican convention, through, uh, through the end of the election. Neil? Yeah, and, and this is where, you know, Joe and I, you know, there, I mean, there's a little divergence here in terms of what we saw. Um, I, I, I know you, your question is debate moving to the middle, but let me let me go back a second, John, and mm -hmm. talk about what, what Joel mentioned. Um, we came out our, uh, we had great hopes for our convention. That not that we would necessarily move ballot numbers, but move mixed image numbers. That was our opportunity, kind of to, to reshape, kind of shape his image a little bit more. Um, it was modestly successful, if not overwhelmingly modestly successful. We stepped on it again with, you know, with uh, with Clint Eastwood, the chair. That, you know, that kind of got out of hand. Um, and then the Democratic convention was right on the tails of, of ours. So it stepped on on whatever, you know, any kind of significant balance we would have got. But I think one of the key things that's missed in this election and, and the, the review and analysis of it was the significant impact the Democratic convention had on on the on the race, um, in terms of the overall mood of the country, Obama approval rating, Obama fave on fave, uh, information flow. We went into that convention with about 36%, 35% of Americans saying the country's headed in the right direction on that 30, on that right direction, wrong track question. It's a Dow Jones industrial average of politics. Um, after that convention, within days, after the Bill Clinton speech and the Obama speech, it went up to 41 and 42% right direction a six-point increase on a measure that is unbelievably tough to move over a short period of time. It, it galvanized, that convention galvanized Democrats. It gave them hope that Obama would actually do what he, what he set up to do in his first term, he, it, it give him another chance to do it in his second term. And it made these voters much more optimistic. It by itself changed the mood of the country. And then they seemed to ride that throughout the rest of the election so that on election day, 46% of Americans said the country's headed in the right direction. John, if you told me that a year out, I said, well, I can tell you what's going to happen in this race. We're going to lose. 46% right direction. It was 20% one year ago before the election, and it was 46% on election day. But, Neil, uh, that phenomenon you talked about, the Democratic Convention, is that a function of simply timing and the fact that Democrats got to have theirs after you, or was it a function of how good the convention was itself. Yes. Well, sure, I know it's both, but, but in other words, if they had had a, uh, a, an ordinary convention, would more or less the same thing have happened? Um, no, not, no, not to that extent. I, I, it wouldn't have, it's, um, you, they needed an extraordinary convention to move numbers like that. They had, they had a very good convention. I mean, and the other thing is, there was nothing after that to, to kind of change the, uh, um, to change the dialogue for two weeks, John, after that, in our verbatim comments on our surveys, I kept having to read these damn comments about how great Bill Clinton was in the, in the, in the, in the uh, convention. You know, it, it was getting tough. And so, so then you went from there into the 40s. So, so they got a nice, uh, I called it at the time, the sugar high from the Democratic convention, but it really was more than that in terms of the mood of the country. Um, then he went into the 47 percent. I mean, needless to say, September was really a miserable month for us. I mean, we just, it was, it was tough. So that I remember how gloomy you were when we had lunch in Boston right about the end of September. 
was not a happy yeah, day for you. I was not. I was not looking forward to another five weeks like, like the last four we'd had. Um, but the October third debate really did change things. We saw numbers move, and it was not, it was more than just um, it was Obama came down some. Our numbers moved up. Our information flow moved up. And the other thing we saw was volunteers, money, enthusiasm, crowds. So it wasn't, in your view, just people coming back who were going to come back anyway. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I know, I know Joel's data indicates that. I, I think it was, they, they might not have come, given the campaign we were, we were running so far, they might not have come back. Um, but we felt, we felt like we, we had some momentum. And then you had the long, then you had a long, we had like 13 days between the first debate and the second debate. And we felt like that things were, were beginning to head our direction, that this was beginning to get a, be a tight race. And we saw numbers close, you know, in not just in our kind of our uh, swing state tracking, but in individual states. And, and John, one other, I'm sorry, one other thing. I don't mean to, to, to go on a monologue here. But you talked about um, wouldn't have been good to have done that earlier, to move to the middle earlier. Listen, what made voters move toward Mitt Romney was not that he moderated his views. What, what he was... The, the Obama campaign had done such a good job in depicting Mitt as an outsourcer, as a job killer, as a bad businessman, as a terrible governor, that when he was actually able to be on the stage next to Barack Obama and he was articulate and he was thoughtful about these issues, you know, he didn't have horns. I mean, they were like, okay, you know, my God, maybe he's not what they, they, uh, they depicted him to be. And we, we had to benefit as a result of that. Joel, do you feel guilty about having helped David <laughs> propagate what were obviously lies about Romney? <laughs> um, you know, I, I said during the course of the campaign that, uh, that Mitt Romney uh, got his high unfavorable ratings the old-fashioned way. He <laughs> earned them. Uh, during the primaries, during the primaries, and during the general, he made a series of statements, whether they're gaffes or not, that were very alienated to a lot of the swing voters that you're trying to persuade. And, I, you know, look, you've got to be lucky, as well as good in campaigns sometimes. And some of our luck uh, was really made at, at some of the things that uh, I, I think Governor Romney said dur during the course of the campaign. The 47 percent thing which came out late was, was problematic, um, to say the least. Uh, but a, a couple of slight differences, and I think this is one where Neil and I disagree uh, in, in terms of how we approach some things as pollsters. I mean, the truth is we never really spent a lot of time thinking about the right track, wrong track number in the country. And the reason is because when it was 36 percent before the Democratic Convention, we were still winning. And we were at 50 percent of the vote. And one of the things we had to do early on was say, in the face of all of these traditional metrics that are against us, how do we carve out a path to getting to 50 percent? You know, there were things other than those metrics that were, uh, you know, if you will, behind the curtain of what voters were thinking about the economy, the state of affairs that we had to address and talk to, and even talking about the president's accomplishments in a way that reinforced some character <laughs> dimensions about him, which were very easy. You know, the auto bailout wasn't just that he saved jobs, it was that he did something that was very unpopular at the time, and Americans and the voters we were persuading remembered that. Uh, they they kind of grudgingly acknowledge it. Yeah, I wasn't happy about it, but he did the right thing. So, um, you know, we were trying to construct a campaign in the face of numbers like the right track, wrong track, that would allow us to get to 50 percent. Um, so, look, the thing about the 47 percent, and again, we do have this slightly different uh, perspective on the fall. You know, the exit polls showed that 70 percent of people made up their mind by September 1st. President Obama had a seven-point lead among that 70 percent. That basically meant that uh, he had a 4.9 percent lead nationally with two months to go and 30 percent of the people who just hadn't definitively made up their mind. Mitt Romney would have had to have won those, that 30 percent by 17 points in what was a pretty close electorate, no matter how you slice the cake. The one thing in, in, from September, and I think races are pretty baked by the conventions, by the way. I think Neil. I agree with Neil, we had a good convention. It definitely helped uh, solidify our image and, and some of our attributes. But, um, you, you know, I think the one thing that you want to avoid in the fall or, or that you worry about is some external event that changes the dynamic of the race or some dramatic thing that either, uh, uh, you know, reinforces your negative uh, in a way that creates a problem. On the upside, 
some dramatic thing that really reinforces your positive could change the dynamic. But other than those kind of three things, I believe the presidential races, if you look back through the fall, have stayed pretty constant uh, from September. And I'm not saying the election was over. You still have to stay on track and do all those things. Neil, I want to ask you one quick point on, on what uh, Joel just said, and then I'm going to come back to Joel. In terms of the external event, there are some people who make the argument that Hurricane Sandy and uh, punctuated by the actions of the Republican governor of New Jersey, swung the election to Obama. Do you believe that? Um, no. Um, but I do say that, I mean, I do believe that Hurricane Sandy made the race, um, I, I get had it was a factor in the race. I think, I mean, if you look at, we, we track this pretty carefully, and you look at our numbers, um, State by state, our information flow, um, momentum questions we asked. Uh, Obama came out of the, the Hurricane Sandy event uh, scoring much better with, in terms of image and information flow, and, and uh, he gained a point on the ballot. It made, it made a difference to us in terms of whether, um, in terms of, I think, where we, we could have won Florida and we could have won Virginia, maybe Ohio, but here's the deal. There was not, we didn't have the other state. I mean, so I, I think, yes, it had an impact. The race would have been, a, we'd have been up later on election night, but I don't think it would turn on, on Sandy. Um, Joel, I want to ask you about this point you made about how inelastic the electorate was. Politicians always say, well, uh, I don't listen to pollsters because I don't need pollsters to tell me what to, what to think or what, what to advocate, but I, I uh, use polling to help me figure out the best way to communicate to voters. If, in fact, in the polarized environment that we're operating in, the number of voters who are um, moving or susceptible to move is very small, and in fact, they don't really move all that much, does that make polling less relevant to campaigns? Well, first of all, the campaigns are pretty long. So they got inelastic as we got really coming out of the Republican primary. There was some movement um, from kind of early May until about September, uh, late August, right, right around the time of the conventions. So there was some movement. The race was closest, in our view, in uh, June, uh, late May, early June. Um, and then, you know, we kind of got back to a three or four point lead and, and stayed pretty much there. Look, I, I tell clients when they, you know, hire us or interview us to hire us that I will not tell you what position to take on an issue. I'll use the polling to help you make the most persuasive argument to get people to your side. So I think even when you have a narrow slice of voters, that becomes even more important. How do you create the maximum impact when you've got a smaller group? Now, there are a lot of technologies we're all using. We had a great analytics team who did a lot of stuff with, with data and modeling and outreach, uh, even down to the one-on-one -on -one level uh, using social media. Um, but I think you have to sharpen your message even more. I think you've got to find those voters that you can reach and persuade and be even sharper with your message. In other words, you're worth even more in this environment than before. Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know if you're worth more, but it's, it's a valuable part of the process. Yeah. Just like TV ads in a world where people are still uh, going to a lot of other ways of consuming news and media, television ads are not going to go away as a relevant way to get your message out. Neil, I want to ask you about... Well, hey, well, John, yeah. John, wait a second. I mean, the, the point that Joel makes here is really good in terms of we didn't start off with, like, you know, with 6% undecided or 6% kind of swing vote. We started with a significantly higher chunk than that. And I think the way the Obama campaign ran their campaign, you know, addressed those, those voters better than we did early on. They're, the marquee kind of... Um, I think event, or at least you know, decision they made was to d begin to define Mitt Romney in April and May and June, while we were still recovering from our primary. You're, you know, they're running, you know, thousands of points of gross, three thousand points of gross rating ads in some of these, you know, these key markets in June, when we were not in a position we could we could really respond. But Neil, they some of the research has. Uh... And I haven't done the research, but some people who have, have have written pieces saying the evidence is that those ads didn't move very much. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, hey, John, we said the same thing during the campaign. <laughs> <laughs>
And, and here's what it didn't move. It didn't move the ballot. No, who the hell cares? It moved the image and the underlying attributes about Mitt Romney that made it impossible for us later to move the ballot. So I, I've seen that same piece of evidence. Yeah, I, you know, they're looking at the wrong damn thing, John. Let me ask you, um, Joel, about the efficacy of polling. What, one of the things that we talked about a lot during the campaign, there was a, those of us like me who write and talk about polling in the media got a lot of flack from people based on what the model of the electorate in the poll uh, looked like. Uh, what was the balance of Democrats and Republicans? What was the share of white voters? What was the share of African-American voters? Who was gonna turn out? Was it gonna look like 2008 or 2010? Um, and while reporting some of that, you, you become aware of what seems to be, at least on the surface, an increasing difficulty in doing the jobs that you guys do because of changing ways that people communicate. Uh, do, you, do you try to reach them on the internet? Do you try to reach them with, a, with a, an automated dialing machine? Do you have to get a phone contact? How much of a challenge, Joel, do you think there is for your business in accurately measuring what you're trying to measure? Well, I, I think you gotta keep up with the, the means of communication and you know, just as we have to add in cell phones, um, you know, uh, we're not yet doing uh, pure voter polling on the internet, uh, but I suspect in, the, in, in a short amount of time we will be. The reason we don't in, in our business is Neil and I, unlike the public entities that poll, we're working on voter lists in a race like this. People where you have some vote history and you have some vote information. Um, no one's really created a good internet list with vote history yet. Um, so there are some states where you still may do a random digit dial sample like the public pollsters do. But you gotta keep up with all those trends. We experiment, we did actually in this cycle, uh, my firm did polling, another guy at my firm did polling for Senator Kane in Virginia. And at one point we did a test with uh, a voter file, random digit dial, um, uh, automated dial, and an internet test. Um, and the difference between those methodologies is that you just, if you know what the electorate, if you have a good model of what the electorate looks like, you can weigh an automated dial sample or an internet sample to look like the electorate and get pretty good results. It just takes a lot more time and a lot more weighing of the data. And anytime you're putting more weights on the data, you're creating potentially some variations that may be a little less reliable. So at some point I suspect we'll catch up and maybe in our careers we'll be polling in a national race on the internet. I don't well, know. What that's Neil what I was going to say, Neil. Do, do you agree that it's measurements becoming simply harder to do? And do you think 10 years from now telephone polling will still be done? Uh, no, of course it'll still be done, but it is becoming more difficult. And and that's the topic I think that you're going to follow, you're going to do on Wednesday night with the the kind of perils of public polling, and uh, and what uh, Axelrod talks about is the security of public polling. But you're, you're going to cover that then. Um, I never dreamed, uh, you, you couldn't have convinced me six years ago, or four years ago, that I was going to spend a decent, a decent amount of money in our campaign on, on auto dials, on IVR polling. And yet we did. You know, we... we, we These we, are the machines, he's talking about the machines that uh, uh, put out robocalls and the uh, communications regulations prohibit them from calling cell phones. And that's one of the things that Joel was talking about waiting for, because if you're, if you're using a machine to call like that, uh, you're undersampling young people and, and the kind of people who communicate only by cell phones. I mean, so I mean, it, it has changed dramatically over the past you know, decade or so. It's gonna continue to change. It's, it makes our business much more difficult. Um, let me ask you, I don't know what our time is like. What time is it right now? Five after seven. Okay. So it, after this question, we're going to go to audience um, questions. But I wanted to ask you just each of your perspectives on what, in the end, seemed to be the core issue of disagreement between the two of you, um, which was your assessment of what the electorate was going to look like. And I talked to both of you guys the day before the election, and the pictures that you were describing of what the electorate uh, was going to be like were very close to one another, but they were slightly different, like one or two points. You know, what was the white electorate going to be? What was the black electorate? What was the Hispanic? What was the share of young people? 
Neil, what is your perspective on that uh, analytical difference in, in terms of why it, why it was different than, than you thought? Uh, was it something uh, exceptionally powerful about the Obama campaign or simply the changing demographics of the country? Well, John, as you and I talked at the time, we were not too far off. I mean, I was right. looking at a electorate that was, I think, 73 percent. You were 73 white. and he was 72, or 71, and, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, but um, the real difference was partisanship. Was, I mean, we're looking at a, a three-point Democratic margin. It ended up being a six-point Democratic margin. And let me tell you why I think that happened. I mean, I, you get you get credit to the Obama campaign for this, but we were, the, the, if we made a mistake in looking at our data, it was looking at voter intensity, voter enthusiasm, voter motivation, and potentially mistaking that for uh, voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And as it, as it turns out, I mean, we saw numbers among Latinos, among African-Americans, Joel, 20 points lower in terms of voter interest this year than, two, than four years ago. Did it make a difference in turnout? No. What happened was the Obama campaign and the, the, the efficiency of their get out the vote operation washed away completely whatever advantage we had in terms of energy, in terms of intensity, interest, motivation, enthusiasm, washed it completely away simply because they you know, they had a, a phenomenal a get out the vote operation. And so I think that that had a, a significant role in, uh, in kind of changing the electorate in certain states, in a Virginia, in an Ohio, in a Florida, in a Nevada, in a Colorado, et cetera. So, Joel, think, is, is the reason that you had a different idea is that you knew how extraordinary the Obama turnout operation was? Or what was it that uh, you think is behind that difference of analysis? Well, I, I don't know, because Neil and I will have to sit down over a couple of beers and talk in detail about what our models were. I was, I was hoping that would be tonight. Yeah. <laughs> I was, too. We missed an opportunity once before to do it, but we will do it. Um, look, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that uh, we, we may have... Uh, I think on the partisanship point, um, there's always a, a, a debate about how you should look at party identification. I mean, Neil says at the end there was a six-point party ID spread that's nationally. We were very conservative all the way through about um, allowing our, our party ID to, to float. We, we kind of kept it very tight. We were conservative on that as well. I don't know where some of the other nuanced differences might have been. It might have been within some of the demographics, you know, uh, that that we set up a model that, that, that proved pretty close to where we ended up and where the vote ended up. I think the enthusiasm point Neil makes is a good one. And it, again, it's one of these things where, and this is just a hypothesis, I don't know how Neil asks the question, but you know, if you've made up your mind in August that you're voting for Barack Obama, and no matter what happens between August and November, you're gonna vote, and pollsters are asking you on a scale of one to 10 how interested you are in this election, you're probably watching football on Sundays and not really thinking about the election a lot. So you might be a five or a six, where a lot of, say, public pollsters would drop you out of their likely voters. We did right? in our NBC Wall Street Journal poll. But those folks were going to vote. They just weren't paying that much attention because they'd made up their mind. And if you're not a political junkie, you know, watching, you know, 24-7 news, your interest level might show up as lower. In fact, we... So we, do you think that, that question, measures like that of who likely electorates are going to change as a result of this experience and people will realize that that's the yeah. 10 point scale is a bad way to do it. Well, I, I think, well, whatever. Everybody asks a different one. So you guys ask a different version than Gallup. Gallup is reviewing their methodology. They've announced that. They've hired some uh, uh, a professor to help them. Um, I, I suspect Neil would concede tonight that Mitt Romney was never ahead by seven points, which Gallup had you at one point. Yeah, I think that tells <laughs> it all, I'll, right? I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, I think people who are using the same questions to screen for likely voters that you used 20 years ago have to change it. You know, if you ask people, do you know where your voting place is, in a day where most states have it, you could put your zip code in and your address and find out where you vote on your smartphone, you don't need to know where you're going to vote the night before the election. You can find out that morning when you wake up. Neil just said that it wasn't the demography, it was the partisanship. But in, in a circumstance like this, does the demography not drive the partisanship? Isn't that what makes, what, didn't the demographic uh, makeup of the election uh, is what produced the No, six? I think the partisanship, the one thing, and you, you may disagree, I'd be curious your view on this, Neil, because it got a lot of debate during, 
Look, party identification, and we will talk about this probably on, on the panel on Wednesday. My experience in 20 years or so of polling, 18 years, is that party identification doesn't change willy-nilly. It doesn't move up and down. It's not volatile. Whatever party people are in this room, tell me the le how, how many people in the last 10 years identified with a different party than you identify with today? Just show, show me your hand. Thank you. Two people have raised their hands. This is not something that moves month to month. When it moves, it moves incrementally. It moves late in a campaign when independents may start deciding they're a soft Democrat or a soft Republican as they're voting for the candidate of that party. Or people who feel a little disaffected about their candidate may tell you in a poll now, I'm an independent, I'm not that weak Republican or soft Republican anymore. And so I think that caused a lot of debate and a lot of the media experts and a lot of you know, PhDs, I had a conversation with a professor today, said, you can't weigh party ID. And I said, well, that's fine, but if it swings by eight points and you think six million people in the last month who were Democrats in September no longer think of themselves as Democrats, then you got another problem other than what's in your poll, because they don't change that easily. All right, we've got a microphone in the center of the room, and uh, I'm guessing that we have some people with a few questions, so make your way up. Hi, thank you for coming here. There seemed to be a split between the Republicans in the aftermath of the election, whether they need to ha moderate their positions or if they have a messaging problem. I just wonder what your thoughts were on that. Neil? Uh, hey, John, would you repeat the question? I, the, the question was that there was a, there's a debate among people who think the Republicans simply need to communicate better and have a better message versus those who think they need to change the substance of their uh, positions. Moderate. Where do you come down on? Moderate. Moderate. Yes, move to the center. Um, you, you, Republicans are, I think it's a combination, but you're not, you're not going to find our guys deciding to moderate their positions, quote unquote. I think to some extent our positions on issues like immigration are changing. They are certainly evolving. Um, but I think we had several problems this, this last election. Uh, we began with communications and uh, and you know we were forced too far to the right in the uh, in the in the primaries. But um, I, I, if if your if your recipe for fixing the Republican Party is to moderate, that that's not a recipe that's going to be uh, uh, welcomed with open arms. And I, I don't think that's going to that's going to work for the Republican Party. And and you you don't think that the Republican Party needs to be a more moderate party to win presidential elections again? Well, I me, mean, John, you got to define what the heck moderate means. I mean, it's it mean, it mean more like Democrats. No, but I mean, it's uh, there are and it, 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 it's a little more complicated response. I mean, but no, no, to be a more moderate party, no. Joe, what do you think? Um, I think that there's a generational divide in America right now um, that the Republicans are on the wrong side of. That's problematic for them. I think that's a, it's palpable when you look at attitudes on a range of issues among people over 50 and under 50. It's really profound when you look at people under 40 and over 40. And it's on some really uh, uh, dynamic issues that have to be resolved, whether you're talking about energy, uh, immigration, uh, gay marriage, issues of women's health, issues of early childhood education, guns, a host of issues that are uh, really quite dynamic and important. And whether you want to call it moderating or not, uh, they're going to have to find a way to uh, capture people who they could lose for generations. Because if people under 40 are like the sample of the 100 people in this room who don't change their party identification too easily, um, that badge that people are wearing today is going to stay with them for a long time. Joel, how old are you? 60. Oh, well, I was going to say your key advantage in the election might be you're younger than Neil, but I don't think you are. Okay, who else? Uh, thank you. I was actually just wondering, so both of you obviously did a lot of polling, uh, both following positive and negative or contrast ads, and I was wondering whether or not you saw one was significantly more effective. I know a lot of discussion has been into the early defining of Mitt Romney uh, by the Obama campaign, and whether or not at a certain point it makes more sense to switch the tone uh, just basically on when each type of ad is more effective. Thank you. You want Neil? You want to go first, or you want me to? I want you. Why don't you go on this one? 
we could have David Axelrod answer this question. Yeah. Um, look, I think there were a couple of things in this election that really struck us early on. Um, one of the things was that we were stunned at how, when you showed ads to focus groups of swing voters, if it didn't have the candidate's name attached saying, I approve this message, how early on people go, oh, that's one of those super PAC ads. Super PACs kind of permeated the consciousness very early. The other thing that was clear was that if you were going to talk about your opponent, you had to do it in a very factual way. You couldn't do it in an over over-the-top way. Uh, and it had to be relevant. It couldn't be gratuitous. And that's probably always been true. But I think we all felt that was more true now. Uh, it's a great question, by the way. Um, the other point is we tried to keep a positive track on the ad all the way through. Neil talks about the, the early advertising, which has gotten a lot of, of conversation in May, June. But there, there were low-level positive tracks on. I think I'm correct about this. Significant numbers all the way through. Uh, we had a women's track that spoke about, you know, issues like education, Medicare, a range of things that were still on the positive side of the conversation. I think. What do you, you mean by low-level track? Well, I, I mean, I don't know what the ad buy was. Again, Axe could do it. I don't remember that we, whether we had 3,000 GRPs at that point or not, but there was always a positive track on. You're talking about uh, less prominent ads uh, running in less volume that were... In other words, not all 3,000 were positive, right. but a subset of that was always committed to positive ads. Look, we, we got asked the question by Neil, which I thought was a, a good question. I'd love your take on this. We were at another one of the post panels. We had President Obama on the air a lot. We knew him talking to camera was extremely valuable. And we did 60-second ads with him. We did 30-second ads. We wanted him talking directly to voters. And, you know, Axe, Jim Morgolis, those guys, the, the ads were fabulous. He was fabulous. They were very on point, And they were completely positive. Hey, hey John, yeah. John let, me, let me respond to that for a sec. Um, First of all, we, we run, we all run negative ads because negative ads work. But, but the key thing here in both the negative ads and the positive ads are the ads that convey new information, information voters have not heard about the candidates have the most impact, whether they're positive or negative. And so the ads that had the most impact against Obama were things they hadn't heard before about Obama. And the same thing in terms of the positives on Obama, you know, putting your charts and graphs you guys showed, new information, putting it, putting it in context people hadn't thought of before. Um, and new information on, on Mitt Romney, on his background in Massachusetts, that kind of stuff. It was new information that has, has the most impact, whether it's positive or negative. So that, so that was the power of like, oh, I knew Romney was a bad guy, but I didn't know he'd given that guy's wife cancer. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's actually an argument, too, here that, that our super PACs, I mean, that the super PACs played a significant role in the campaign. And for us, um, about, I don't, I don't know what the numbers are, I mean, more than half the amount of money was spent on advertising on behalf of Romney was done for, by, on behalf by super PACs. And yet, you could argue their advertising might not have, have, have been might have been all that effective. I mean, we kind of wanted internally, we wanted the sewer packs to go almost too far, to go, I mean, to, to push the envelope, um, because we couldn't do that uh, with you know Mitt's name on it. Um, but the stuff was, I mean, it was good, but it was just it it held back a little bit. We, we would have maybe preferred it to be a little bit stronger, a little more unrestrained. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, both of you, for your comments. Uh, my question uh, is directed, actually, to both, both of the speakers. I helped uh, start a polling company a few years ago focusing on mobile technology and social media and a way to integrate uh, new sources of data and new ways of interacting with people um, uh, now that behaviors are changing. And uh, we've tried to partner with um, sort of many distinguished veteran pollsters who we found very difficult to engage with because of this sort of, I don't know, maybe hesitancy to to adopt technology, and, and, and given that technology was such a big part of both campaigns, um, my question is, to what extent do you think you'll see more interaction between the sort of traditional science of polling and the emerging science of uh, using data and data scientists to predict or, uh, or have a better sense of how voters are going to behave in the days and weeks leading up to the campaign? Well, let, me, let me try that one. Um, first of all, we've read all the clips from the Obama campaign about your data analysts and about the uh, you know the, the dark room you guys kept these guys in, um, and uh, I think there's there, we have a party on our side that is committed to 
expanding toward that direction. So we, I, you know, the guy needs to email me his, uh, his information on the talk. <laughs> um, look, I, I think uh, Nate Silver recognizes this, what I'm about to say in his book. I, I often, I, I was uh, uh, mis, uh, I wasn't misquoting, but I was misapplying the quote to Albert Einstein. He had it written on his board in his office. It's actually a sociologist who said, not everything that can be counted necessarily counts, and not everything that counts can necessarily be counted. So your data analytics are only going to be as good as the experience and the knowledge that experts uh, can apply to that data set. And I think we will never get to a point where only the data and the analytics will drive strategy. You still need the human dimension. And even Nate Silver, whose forecasts were right, uh, has a similar uh, comment in his, in his book, which he says the data can't speak for itself, we have to speak for it, and he talks about the risk of failure when we remove ourselves from the process. So, well, and for the same reason but, that however great a, a campaign machine you right. built for Barack Obama, if you get a human being who's not Barack Obama as the candidate, it may not work at all. Every election's gonna be different. As far as the technology, though, I mean, I know at my firm, we believe that eventually our business is gonna migrate to smartphones. And I think that, you know, certainly in the consumer world, uh, many companies are recognizing that, you know, the most uh, potent searches people are doing are doing from their smartphones, that what they're doing from a computer, they're not really ready to buy a product, but when they're on their smartphones, they are. Go ahead. Thanks, guys. Uh, so I imagine it's always better for you to be ahead in the <laughs> polls, but I'm wondering how concerned are the campaigns uh, about either being too far ahead or too far behind in the polls affecting voter turnout. And I'm also thinking about uh, exit polling on some of the early voting. Um, I assume you're talking about overconfidence of one side in yeah, the voters or, not turning uh, out. Hey, looks like we're gonna lose anyway, why bother? Either, either way. I mean, I think when you're ahead with a big lead, you're comfortable because you've got a big lead and it would take a massive shift again if people you know, typically or not, you know how many people are undecided at the end. If you're in a close race, uh, that's gonna generate excitement. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, being behind in a poll, uh, being behind in polls, we've been behind in races, I think in 2007 and eight, there were a lot of times when we were behind in that race. The goal is, can you map a strategy to get you in front or win? Um, and that's what you focus on from the polling. I think on the, on the getting out the vote side, uh, you can never let up on that. I mean, I was never as much a believer in field operation and voter turnout as I've become in the last four years seeing it at play in these last two presidential elections. Hey, you know, John, we were, we were behind uh, in the primaries in, I think, eight different states and came back to win them. So, that, you know, that, being behind is just, is, is, is a, we got to look at it as a kind of a temporary, you know, point in the campaign. And it's not just you're behind, okay, how do we how do we move ahead? What do we have to do? So it's just, it's, you know, it's you're behind at halftime at the, at the uh, Duke-Boston College game. So, so what? And we know how that came out. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, I have a question about the um, history of your business, I guess. Um, both of you have obviously been in this business for a very long time soon. Could you talk about how the industry or the let's say the business of polling has, or the specifics of polling has changed from the time when you first started polling to right now what um, demographic or technological issues have changed, stuff like that. I'm gonna start with Neil because he's been in polling longer than Joel. Yeah. <laughs> well actually the very first poll I participated in, we were, we, I did door to door interviewing Joel. <laughs> Gives you an idea how, how, how long ago that was. Um, you know, we were worried when I first started polling about some communities who didn't have uh, didn't have uh, landlines at all, just didn't have, you know, we didn't have phone penetration. So that's changed, I mean, and how people use phones and the the inclination to actually answer the phone has, you know, our incidence rate has gone through the, you know, through the floor in terms of people be, being willing to answer the phone. And now you've got the demographics that are changing dramatically. I mean, you look at the demographics of the, of the country over the last 20 years since Ronald Reagan was, was well, actually, you know, 30, 40 years since Reagan was elected, and you know the minority population has gone up, it's harder to reach people. Um, it's making what we do much more of an art rather than a science, and uh, it's just become it's becoming more difficult. 
Um, I see a dude uh, in the middle of the room who wants to ask a question, but before I go to his question, I just want to see if there's something that you uh, both could agree on. W would you both agree that Nate Silver knows more about this than either of you guys know? I, I think we could both agree on it, and the answer's no, yeah. right? <laughs> Look, Nate, Nate's a forecaster. He does, you know, uh, forecasting. He doesn't do polling. He's not a poll. He knows, he knows more about baseball stats than either of us. We'll give him that. He did get the Super Bowl wrong. <laughs> well, what he does is he aggregates data and he analyzes that data. And based on the data he, he analyzes, he makes projections. I will point out, Neil, that on uh, September 1st of uh, 2011, Nate Silver said the St. Louis Cardinals had a 1% <laughs> chance of winning the World Series, <laughs> and they did. So, uh, just uh, underscores that these everyone's fallible. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I think that uh, with no margin of error, 100% of us can agree that you guys are great professionals. And uh, Neil, you've been unbelievably gracious in giving your uh, time tonight and all your efforts to get here and be a part of it. And you know, one of the things that we're trying to stress here at the Institute of Politics is that you, we can disagree and disagree strongly uh, on issues of public policy. We can compete strongly in campaigns and still, uh, and still admire each other as professionals, admire each other uh, as people who care deeply about this country and are willing to spend our time trying to, to move it in the direction we think is best. And uh, you exemplify that, Joel, you exemplify that. And John Harwood, you're a heck of a great moderator and a great <laughs> journalist. We're lucky to have you all, and I want to thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go Duke.